I self-host a lot of stuff, and I mean a lot of stuff. Like this Git instance, for instance. I also happen to run a personal database. Some of the stuff I self-host I even coded up myself like this message broker, and I run this event calendar from that personal database that I showed you guys just before. So the trick with self-hosting stuff is how do you actually access this stuff securely from a remote location? It's all well and good while I'm on my home computer, but let's say I'm out somewhere and I want to use it. Well today, we're going to look at SSH port forwarding both as a concept and also writing a management utility to run and connect multiple SSH port forward connections all at once, restart them if they crash or if the computer goes to sleep and the connection's terminated, so that you can access all your self-hosted infrastructure from any computer anywhere in the world. And we're going to do it all in under 250 lines of code. Okay guys, before we dive into coding, let's do a little conceptual overview to make sure we understand what we're trying to achieve here. So what even is SSH port forwarding anyway? I'm sure you're familiar with SSH as a regular utility. You can use it to set up an encrypted tunnel to get a secure shell, that's its whole thing, right? Secure shell on a remote computer. And it sets up this encrypted tunnel on port 22 or whatever you have it configured to. Well, you can do a very similar thing for other services that are running on the computer. So for example, if I have a service running on port 9000, let's say, it is by default, provided my firewall allows for it, accessible to the computers on my local area network. However, if I wanna access this remotely, what I could do is port forward that on my router settings so that all traffic coming to my home address, home IP address, is forwarded to that computer on port 9000. Now this is not great in a couple of ways. Like for example, if that service, if I haven't really set it up to be secure or done hardening on it, just straight up opening that port might be a bad idea. Unless I've set up SSL or TLS or something like that, the tunnel is not likely to be encrypted by default. So what SSH can do for you is essentially set up a listener where it will forward anything that it receives on that port, on that machine, to your local machine over its own encrypted tunnel that it's already set up. So you can think of it kind of like a middleman. You want to talk to this service on port 9000. Well, SSH sets up a listener for that and it grabs all the traffic on port 9000, shoves it through its encrypted tunnel and spits it back on port 9000 on the other side. So really, all you need to have for this is SSH port forward and hardened, and it's really, really powerful. Let's take a look at the problems I've been having with SSH port forwarding and how I want to fix that with code. So problem number one is that the SSH process will exit if the connection dies. So of course, you have a keep alive or something set in your SSH connection, and if that drops, the process just exits. And I've tried having systemd and openrc manage this and like try and restart it automatically, but I found it to be kind of spotty. Like sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And there's another program called auto SSH that I've also used, but it seems to be spotty in restarting the SSH connection as well. It's, it's just a bit strange. I've had all sorts of problems and none of these existing solutions have really, uh, really done it for me. Okay, I've decided to do this one in Go because it's going to be a long running process that I want to be pretty light, pretty efficient, but I also want to do config file stuff, so that's probably going to be a lot easier to do with the built-in hash maps. And I've already decided on my config file format, so I've just done up an example here in JSON of kind of what I want with these config files here. So con artist, that's what I'm calling it, connection artist. It's kind of a play on words, you know, con artist, it's kind of, yeah, you, you get the joke, it's funny. But literally what I want is I want the name of the connection. So this could be the service that I'm trying to forward. And then I want an array with the host, the type. So that's TCP or Unix sockets. I also want to be able to forward Unix sockets. And then of course the port or the location of the Unix socket. Post editing here, I thought I would just throw this in. The prerequisite for this config file to actually work properly is that you've already set up your ssh.config such that um, you know you can automatically log in with a key file without needing a password and you've defined your hosts up like so. And if, like I mentioned before, you want to access this stuff remotely, you should configure a proxy jump or you know if you're hosting it all on the one service, just have the public IP as the thing in the hostname section.
Yeah, go is going to be the go for this one. Now, what I'm going to do is define up the basic uh, SSH commands and stuff, because the way that go exec stuff works is you've got to pass the command and then you've got to pass a list of arcs or a slice, I suppose. So I'm going to go ahead and define the base command here just as a string and it's going to be SSH, of course. I've gone in and copied the arguments that we want to pass to our SSH process. So let's go through these. We've got dash n. So that one means essentially like I don't want a remote shell, don't execute anything. We've got some options here. So exit on forward failure equals yes. That's important because that will exit the SSH command if it can't forward the remote port. So that'll signal to our, you know, our connection manager that SSH had a failure. It's exited. Let's try again and restart it. Um, stream local unbind unlink. Yes, that's important because when we're dealing with Unix sockets, Basically, SSH will remove, like do an RM on this Unix socket before it tries to forward, just clean up the previous connection that was there. We absolutely do want that because otherwise it'll fail and crash and it'll never get out of that. Server alive interval equals five. That's basically just like, I want you to send a keep alive to the server every five seconds. And server alive count max equals one. If we fail one of these keep alive heartbeat messages, SSH will exit and we'll just restart, which is totally chill. So first things first, let's try and read in all of this config data so that we know that we've actually got it in a format our program can do something with. So in order to do that, I'm going to keep it all in a map of slices. So I'm going to say maybe config container map string a slice of strings. Now we're just making sure that we don't get an error when read in the file. So I'll just say like error reading file and we'll exit with a one code if we get an error reading in this file that we've defined up here. Now we can try and read back the data in here. So we know what format it's going to be and we can do just like an error equals json.unmarshall. We give it the file and the variable we want to store it in and then we'll just do our error code again. So we'll say error on marshalling and OS exit two. And I actually found out because this thing was complaining. This actually, to unmarshal it correctly in Go, this needs to be a map of interfaces. And we're going to have to have another one for the map of strings. So essentially what we're going to be wanting to do is convert this map of interfaces to a map of sling slices, which is what this kind of is in the background, but it just doesn't expose that when we unmarshal it. Like it has to be unmarshaled as an interface. That's just how it works. So now that our information is in config container, we can start to loop through it. And remember, this is going to be a, uh, it's gonna be a map of interfaces. So we're gonna have to do some funky stuff with the typing here to, in order to convert it back to the slice strings that we want. So what we can do is do a switch on, I'm going to call this interface type, and this is going to be config container i dot type. And basically what would this will let us do is go through every single uh, type here that we could possibly have. So default, I'm just going to continue like that's not going to be a thing. And I think this is what we want to be doing. No, this is going to have to be a uh, slice of interfaces. We can pretty much go ahead and do the exact same thing that we did with interface type, but now we're looping through these interfaces and we're actually going to see what every interface is. So just loop through this one and we do the exact same thing, but on the value of this slice now. And now we know this is a string. So we can literally just straight up go, what did I call this one up here? Con config, con config. Um, and I'm going to call it I dot uh equals append i almost dot dude i did too much python I almost did dot append but this is going to be our actual slice of strings so we can do con config i and if it's uninitialized it'll just append this first thing and this is going to be a value type so this is the actual value of the thing that we want and default we're just going to skip it again like that this is kind of yucky like i don't really like this if you guys know a better way to go from unmarshalling this data, which is like interfaces to the string. Like, I just kind of don't like how many indentation levels we're on here. Like it works fine, but it's just kind of, I don't like it. So now we know that we have our config in our great little map of slings, sling slices. I keep saying that, sling slices. Let's just go ahead and loop through this uh, string slices. Uh, that's not correct. It should be con 
on fig. I really did a number on these variable names here, but we'll do fmt print ln, and we can print out the entire slice by doing uh, this, and I'll also just print out uh, i. So you might want to put that above the slice. And we'll compile this and see how we go. Just had to get rid of the unused exec import, and we are great, guys. You can see here we've got our the name of the connection that we did up in this file, and then we've got all of the metadata associated with that connection. So the next thing we're going to go ahead and do is write our uh, SSH process handlers and the execution method, which is really the fun part of this whole thing. So the way that I kind of want this to work is that I essentially want to have a process watcher for every single SSH, um, you know, connection that we want. So I'm going to pass in the target string. The target is just going to be uh, this one up here. And then I want to also pass in all of this metadata. So this is just going to be our uh, call it metadata, and that's going to be our string sp slice. <laughs> Nearly got me there. But this is nothing but the stuff that we have in this con config. So the target is going to be the key, and then this metadata here are these values. So this is going to obviously start with a while true. Well, for true in Go, because it doesn't have a while loop. But essentially, like, yeah, what we want to do is, like, right here, we want to um, exec and start the process. Then we want to wait for it to exit. And then we'll probably want to, like, sleep for five seconds or something like that. And then, you know, the loop goes back up and we re-exec and start the process again. So that's kind of what I want to do here. We'll see how we go. I defined these two parameters here, and basically what I want to do is split off the exec into a separate function because as I'm expanding this and giving it more functionality in the future, it might be worthwhile to be able to exec it from other areas. So I'm going to pass in the exact same parameters here because really that's um, what's necessary to actually exec the thing in the first place. And I'm going to actually do these exact same ones because this function here is actually going to return literally these two things so this function is going to set up the execution and uh yeah so i'm probably gonna do i've got to check which type it is because i want to have tcp and unix sockets so i'm gonna have to do a switch on metadata it'll be metadata one probably change that to like a define somewhere later on but for now it's probably fine and we'll do i don't know case tcp and case unix and we'll do something special with both of those okay i went and defined those indexes we were talking about for the metadata and down here what i've done is essentially when we pass something to the os exec stuff in go we need to pass it the command line arguments as well and so we take these base arguments here for setting up the ssh port forwarding this dash l by the way here is actually what specifies we want to use ssh local port forwarding which essentially means bring a port from the remote server and pop it on our local machine. So now that we've done that, we can go ahead and create this new slice, which represents our formatted command line arguments. So I've just done this thing here for TCP, which means put the, um, an OBJ index, by the way, is literally just this, either it's this port or this Unix socket. So in the case of TCP, we are putting the port uh, here, and then the host to forward it to on this port. So I think this is the remote port, and then we wanna forward that to localhost on the same port, and I'm just using the same port for both. Very similar thing on the Unix socket side, except this time it's like, you know, remote socket path, and then local socket path. There's no like, you don't have to specify the host. Uh, it's assumed to just be localhost. So that'll do, it'll forward whatever this is to the local port of the same thing if it's a TCP connection or this Unix socket if it's a Unix socket connection. Otherwise, I'm just going to print out uh, what the type was like and exit with a uh, nil command line because like I'm not going to handle any other types at the moment. I don't even think SSH can do that like other types other than TCP or Unix, but haven't really looked into it. So this is where the fun actually happens. Like what I've done here is essentially we make our command line the uh, full command line that we have specified here. Finally, we need to give it the host index, which is the remote host that we want to contact. So we've constructed our forwarding command line up here, and now we just give it the host, which would be uh, this one up here. 
So now we can actually exec that. So to get this uh, exec CMD pointer that we want to return to our process watcher, we can just call exec.command and then we give it the base command, which of course up here is just SSH and we give it our command line arguments. And this dot, 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 essentially what this means is it's a way for you to expand a slice as if it was just like every individual argument. So every member of this slice becomes an individual argument to this function here. So this would be like the same thing as going like command line uh, zero, command line one, you get the idea, right? It's just a shorthand of doing that. And it's pretty cool. Then we just start it, start the process. This will do it in the background. There's also command.run, which I think will block your thread while the thing runs. Don't quote me on that, make sure you check it. But essentially, yeah, we just wanna make sure we start the process correctly. And if the process is started correctly, we'll get a non-nil pointer. So that's what we're gonna to have to go and check here in our process watcher. Uh, I went to compile this and it looks like I just had a brain meltdown moment where I actually called this variable conprams while I was writing this function instead of what I pass it in as. Uh, so that's cool, I guess. I'll just change this. I think metadata probably sounds better, so I might change it to that, but yeah, we'll see. So look, now our thing is done. Theoretically, this is done. And so let me just add some print statements in here. Okay, this thing is now just exiting immediately, which is really weird. Um, so I have to figure out where it is exiting. This was probably my smartest moment of all time. I was spawning this as another go routine when there should just be the function call of the main process. So if we go ahead and just build this and start it up, as you can see here, we have spawned all of these processes. Now, if I come here and I do a kill all SSH, oh, what's that? Check it out, guys. They just died and it's waiting up here to respawn. And now they've respawned. So that's awesome. Let's see if I can actually access one of my services. If I just pull up a new window over here and let's try my git EA. Ah, there we go. Terrific. Terrific. So if I kill SSH, just to prove to you that this is all working correctly, and I refresh this page, as you can see, it's not working. But over here, we will be respawning these in just a second. And if I refresh the page now, it's all good. So how good is that, guys? How good is that? We've just made a connection manager. Now I'll clean it up and I'll show you the final product. Let's go through the uh, cleanups that I've done. So essentially, I've just given it a license. I have this library here that gives me like a nice logging format functionality that's standard across a lot of my own personal services that I write. So I've just kind of gone and done that, given it a version and a title and everything. This is pretty much the same. This is pretty much the same, except I've done some nicer logging stuff. Um, and I'll show you the nice logging stuff in just a second. And then here I'm just setting up some, you know, like metadata parameters, like the computer it's running on, stuff like that. And I've set it to read a file from my home directory, just like a .config, because this is standard across all my computers. You probably want to change this. I didn't really bother with, you know, getting the user's ho uh, like home directory dynamically and everything. But um, yeah, anyway, so that's pretty much all I did. If I go ahead and build this real quick and run it for you. You can see here that the logging stuff that I've done is pretty much like this, right? Like it's got uh, nice colors, it says the name of the program, the computer it's running on, it's got timestamps and everything. And if I do a kill all SSH, just to show you something, you can see here that the, you know, like the color of the log changes. So that's just kind of nice, right? And um, yeah, it'll just spawn them back up. And I've given the process ID as well as a, as a printout thing here. So that's pretty much all I've done on the modification front. And now this thing is ready for prime time. So I just remoted into my laptop real quick because what I want to show you guys is that I actually wrote a systemd service file for this. So if I go systemctl dash dash user dash dash no status uh, and I call this m dash con artist. You can see here I have been battle testing this thing for about a day now. And it's been terrific. Like, you know, at all hours of the morning when I put this thing to sleep, uh, it realizes that things died when I wake it up, you know, at some point, and then it respawns the processes. It's been really, really good. 
So it's, yeah, I haven't had any issues with this method as opposed to the other ones. It does exactly what I want it to do. It's, it's actually really, really nice.